Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. Teledyne Judson Technologies is a global leader in the design, development, and manufacturing of high-performance infrared detectors, arrays, and cameras that accelerate the discovery of solutions to many of the world's challenges. Email the team at infrared at teledyne.com to learn how they can help you with your sensing challenges in the infrared. In a clinical setting, and in many other settings too, photonics is taking on a role of ever-increasing importance. And as photonics advances, so too does the ease with which disease is diagnosed. It's great news for clinicians and patients alike, as in many cases, diagnosis is incredibly tricky, time-consuming, and expensive. Technologies like those that you can embed on a lab on a chip are taking out a lot of the head-scratching and tedium that goes along with deciphering ambiguous imaging and examining cultures, along with other methods. With these new technologies, patients are benefiting as they now have access to technology that is cheaper, quicker, and even more reliable in many instances. Today, we speak with Andrea Armani, the Ray Arani Chair in Engineering and Material Science at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering and Senior Director of Engineering and Physical Sciences at the Ellison Institute of Technology. Armani's research is at the cutting edge of this type of work, as well as another that we'll discuss, optic genetics. Armani is among the most decorated of our guests on all things photonics having received the 2010 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and also recognition as a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. Armani is a fellow of SPIE, Optica, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the National Academy of Inventors. Our conversation with Armani today covers the current landscape of lab on a chip technology, its importance, its current and future capabilities, and the road to commercialization. We'll also discuss optic genetics and what that technology may mean for the future of medicine. And we'll talk about advancements in nanomedicine and what they could mean for the world at large. Next up, news editor Joel Williams speaks with Professor Andrea Armani. Uh, Let's see. So for those of us uh, who might not be so familiar, uh, could you give us kind of a brief overview of what lab on a chip is uh, and where photonics comes into play? Absolutely. Uh, So lab on a chip technologies are really trying to combine uh, a lot of different larger systems, whether it's a sample purification system or a diagnostic system, um, all into a single platform. It could be you know, a one inch by one inch uh, platform that you could put onto a microscope that's able to take a whole sample of blood that hasn't been touched at all and then suddenly tell you if you have cancer that's you know the the long-range dream um usually right now we still have to do some sort of off chip uh purification before it can go into the lab on a chip system Uh, but the dream is that we're able to take you know an entire lab an entire building of equipment and then put it into a little tiny portable thing you could carry in your pocket Um, and carry it around with you and tell you if you have some sort of illness or in the very, very far future, just continuously monitor for very early signs of illness so that you can do preventative and take preventative action. Um, Now, where does photonics come into play? As I kind of alluded, uh, you can use microscopy in combination with lab on a chip technologies. Uh, Usually with a, a lab, if you're a diagnostics lab, you already have optical instrumentation in your diagnostics lab building, um, whether it's a spectrophotometer or a fluorimeter looking for a fluorescence signal or, or a microscope taking a picture. So in your lab on a chip version, you're going to have integrated photonic versions or analogs of these pieces of equipment. It might be a single laser beam going through a little microfluidic channel going to a detector looking for a change in power transmission. It could be the same type of laser beam going through a channel, but looking for a fluorescent signal. Um, So you have the same type of optical technologies, just little, little tiny versions of them um, looking for some sort of sensing signal. 
Excellent. Uh, no, you've already sort of touched on this, but could you explain and sort of put into perspective uh, why this type of technology is important? Uh, and uh, additionally, where have we already seen its impact and where might we expect to see it in the future? Absolutely. Uh, so the technology is important uh, currently because we have we have a lot of the pieces in the healthcare ecosystem, right? We have different types of microfluidic handling systems for faster sample purification, which means that we don't have to give as much blood when we go to the doctor. Um, and then we also have like lateral flow assays, for example, everyone's familiar with this one, the COVID assay, uh, which is an optical assay, right? You're looking for colorimetric change. Now the question is really, can we start combining all of these little pieces into one system? And that's always, I like to say, the you know underappreciated aspect of, of industry is combining all the little pieces because it, it seems easy to combine them. And you think of it like Legos, you can just like snap them all together, but things, things never snap together as nicely as you would hope. Uh, but right now we have all the, the lab on a chip pieces, and if we can get them just to all mate, just to all stick together smoothly, then, then we actually can make it to this lab on a chip platform. And we can start doing things like monitoring for flu and cold and bacterial infections early. And if we can do early detection, then we can do early treatment. And being able to do early treatment means that our therapeutics will be more effective. And, and like we saw with COVID, right, a lot of times, it wasn't COVID itself that was a problem, but it was the bacterial infections and the lung infections that actually caused the ultimate problems. So if we can get early treatment, early detection, early treatment, then, then we can have a much larger impact. Uh, and what would you say is driving the development of these types of technologies? Uh, it seems like there's a lot of research interest coming from the defense sector in particular. Uh, are there specific applications and use cases uh, that we're looking to address there through that type of funding? Uh, so first off, uh, there's kind of two ways that technology is driven, right? There's always the, sure. the scientists who just pursue technology for curiosity's sake. Um, right. Personally, I'm a very curious person. Like I can, I can often end up going down a path and then have to rein myself in. Um, a lot of technologies were originally developed for one application in defense, whether it was, you know, an electro-optic modulator to control different types of wavelengths of light, you know, just switch between them. And then suddenly you realize, oh, hold on, like that could actually be used as a really, really good sensor, even if you didn't originally design it for that purpose. So a lot of the current defense funding, at least in the United States, is was originally developed in a technology called frequency combs, which also got the Nobel Prize. Um, and that's a way of creating really, really spectrally pure, uh, very uniform uh, bands of light uh, that have very clearly identifiable and very well-known frequencies of light, which from a fundamental science perspective is great when you start thinking about trying to down or up convert light, very good for communications. Uh, but then from a biosensing perspective, suddenly you can start thinking about this in terms of creating a spectrograph, All right? So if you know where these wavelengths are with high precision and you have a lot of them, then you can start considering, oh, well, if one of these wavelengths has a slight perturbation, then what's causing that perturbation? And can I use that to actually detect a molecule? So suddenly this technology that was developed you know, to help our communication system and has an impact on atomic clocks, suddenly has now done this, you know, huge pivot to healthcare, uh, to trying to do very, very sensitive detection of molecules, whether it's in gas or in a liquid. So it isn't that originally the defense, just entire defense industry was interested in doing healthcare research. It just happened to be this really impactful side effect. Um, and, you know, Impact is impact. Um, we shouldn't not do something just because it wasn't the original intent. Sure. Uh, now, what are some areas and applications uh, where we're seeing a lot of research interest? So that is a very loaded question. 
Um, everybody, everybody has their own opinion about like what is where is their interest. Um, I think uh, you know the last several decades have really been focused on silicon, silicon photonics. And I'm being really clear to say silicon. Um, right. And like all of the nanofabrication uh, facilities really focused on creating you know, CMOS compatible technology. So S being silicon. Um, but then in parallel, at least in the US, there was the uh, National Nanotechnology Initiative, which had a huge emphasis on making new types of materials beyond silicon. Um, so now I think there's going to be a lot of reconfiguring of nanofabrication facilities to be compatible with non-silicon things, right? Whether it's carbon nanotubes or quantum dots or, you know, aluminum nitride or some sort of crazy material I can't even tell you because it hasn't been invented yet. Uh, so that the idea of thinking beyond silicon and even beyond not even using silicon as a carrier substrate, just crazy materials with amazing properties that we don't even know what they are, but you know, kind of preparing ourselves, both preparing the infrastructure to be able to handle them, but also thinking well outside of this artificial silicon box that we have this mindset in uh, to be able to enable new things. Uh, so really that synergistic combination of new materials and their new properties, and then what are the new devices we can make? And then once we have those new devices, what new things can we do? But there right now, there's this huge toolbox of materials that material scientists and chemists have, have given everybody in optics um, that we really need to start pulling from and leveraging. It's really exciting. It certainly is. Uh, in particular, silicon, uh, mm -hmm. as well as other materials. Uh, and I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about the challenges that come up uh, when you try to use some of those other um, materials uh, yeah. with silicon. Yeah. Um, so one of the biggest commercial cha commercialization challenges is always uh, taking something from an academic lab where it's you know acceptable to to make one of something but actually need to make a hundred of it in order to get the one to work right uh, and in a industry setting you want ideally a hundred to work um, but at the very least 99 of them to work uh, and so being able to scale up your production and have really good reliability is kind of a critical step to move from a university setting to a, a commercial setting. And a lot of times when you start working with new materials, how you overcome the fact that you may not be compatible with conventional fabrication processes is you just do everything by hand. Um, you know, it turns into what I like to say, the, the glass blower situation. Um, and doing everything by hand isn't possible to do at scale. Um, I mean, technically it is, but you're going to need to charge like a million dollars for everything. So sure. it's, you know, you, you need to kind of be realistic. So there's, there's going to be this kind of iterative phase where until there's a critical amount of really cool new materials to motivate this reconfiguring of a lot of these larger manufacturing facilities there's it's going to be a little you know hesitation on the part of companies to actually adopt new materials i mean the blue led is a classic example right that was definitely a completely new material system it had a a large barrier to entry into the market just because of cost um but now it's commercially available, broadly available. It's a little bit more expensive than red, um, but it's available. Certainly. Uh, now for bio and nanomedicine uh, specifically, what would you say are the specific challenges uh, that you would face uh, in commercializing those types of technologies? Uh, and how, that, how does that affect research? Yeah. 
Uh, so bio, especially not just bio research, but medical research, uh, you always need uh, to go through like the phases of research in order to get approval for marketing from the FDA. And this is a very long um, approval process and you don't necessarily have similar approvals for other commercially uh, translatable systems. Um, you know, for example, if you want to create a new chair, this is an extreme example, right? I don't need to get FDA approval to make a new chair. Um, but if I want to create a new therapeutic or a new implantable device, in order to actually sell it, I, I need to go through multiple phases of approval. And not only is there the kind of the fear hurdle, a lot of engineers have never interfaced with the FDA. Um, in fact, they've never interfaced with their university IRB or IACUC committees. Um, there's also just the, the tactical realm of that, right? Like it takes time. Uh, and you know, time is literally money uh, when you have to pay for researchers to, to do the research. So there's a cost burden to it as well as a time burden. Um, so being able to support all of that research and, and, and effort and your personal energy takes a lot of time. Right. Let's see, now it seems like a lot of lab on a chip technologies are used uh, to diagnose very specific ailments. Um, what are the challenges in making technologies that are sort of multi-purpose uh, and what might it take to be able to overcome that? Uh, so one of the reasons why a lot of technologies originally start off like really focused on a specific ailment um, is because you need to be able to motivate its use. All right. Uh, you can't just go to an investment investment banker or a VC or even the government and say, I'm going to make this one stop shop, you know, lab on a chip system. I promise it will work for everything. I mean, you you can. We'll just I'll stop there. Um, and then uh, once you have it working really well for one disease, let's say like prostate cancer, then you can gradually kind of baby step your way over to breast cancer, then maybe step over to liver cancer, maybe from that, right? You, you can kind of like move over to, to related diseases um, or illnesses. The, the challenge is having a uh, suite of collaborators that's broad enough that can give you, you know, the guidance you need to know what markers you should detect, um, to help you give you samples to validate your system. Because usually, personally speaking, as an engineer, I have a collaborator who is an oncologist, but an oncologist who treats patients of a specific type. Um, so my my personal collaborator right now is a prostate oncologist, right? So he that's a patient set that he has, and he can give me really good advice on prostate cancer. If I ask him for advice on breast cancer, he he can give me big picture advice, um, but he's not going to tell me what biomarkers specifically I need to try to detect or what morphology changes I need to look for. He's going to send me to a different doctor. And trying to manage multiple doctors, multiple patient samples, it's very complicated. So usually you want to have, you want to just kind of go through and do it iteratively. Certainly. And, and someone like Abbott or GE, they're just better suited to manage that. That's why it's hard to be a startup. It's hard right. to break it. Uh, I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about that, how uh, some of the larger companies uh, might be able to address um, that type of technology, uh, something that could uh, diagnose uh, multiple uh, diseases. <laughs> Uh, so, well, first off, larger companies, um, they just have the, the intellectual capital, right? right. Uh, which is just, it's infinitely valuable because um, it's, it's usually, it's not something you can buy, uh, but having uh, 
intellectual capital of people who know the challenges in the field, who know the things you should be going after, and who are able to speak multiple languages. And by multiple languages, I don't mean English and French. Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, oncology, biology, engineering, right? They're able to speak across fields. Uh, that is incredibly helpful when, as an engineer, I'm trying to understand a uh, specific cell type or cell types, um, trying to understand like what might be the competition in the marketplace. And if I can talk to an oncologist and they can simplify it for me, but not simplify it to the point of being incorrect, it is very helpful. So for anyone out there, if you if you find an oncologist who can do that for you, like hold hold on to them like they're a you know pot of gold because they are incredibly valuable. Uh, but that is that's one of the strengths of some of the larger companies is they they have this just board and it may not be a literal board but just a, an an internal suite of experts that work side by side a lot of times or just give advice to uh, the people developing or coming up with new technologies. Um, because you can't just develop a new technology in a vacuum. You really need to uh, allow the technology to be pulled from the marketplace, but that means you need to know what the marketplace needs. Uh, now, in, in contrast, uh, in an academic setting, a lot of times you're missing that one-to-one input and so it, it's more of a guessing game uh, and if you don't have that one-to-one -one input it's hard to design something that's quite as targeted uh, which is why there there are a lot of really amazing technologies in university settings that just never fully launch uh, which is really unfortunate uh, that has been uh, it's getting better uh, a lot of the federal agencies in Europe, in the US, uh, in Asia, have started large consortiums. One of my PhD students actually went through an incubator uh, and she got really good advice on how to start how to start a company and like what the pitfalls were with her specific idea. And those types of experiences I think are invaluable, especially for really young entrepreneurs, uh, because a lot of times you think starting a company is just about having a technology. And it's the technology is important, um, but if you don't have a market, then it doesn't really matter how awesome your technology is. Uh, so that those types of programs run by various agencies, I think, are going to make a really big long term impact. Um, but again, you need to have buy in from the companies as well as from existing more senior entrepreneurs who can really mentor the junior cohort of entrepreneurs entrepreneurs you know future entrepreneurs definitely uh now you noted that there uh there are some technologies uh that have been in development uh like in the university and lab settings uh that have sounded promising but have kind of failed to launch uh, I was wondering if you had any specific examples of those uh, types of technologies mm -hmm. uh, that you found interesting or that you were particularly excited about. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, one of my favorite technologies to talk about is one that um, is a biosensing technology. It actually is the foundation of a company called Genolite, uh, which they is a micro ring resonator, a silicon micro ring resonator that uh, is used for multiplex cancer uh, biodetection. Uh, but the fundamental technology was actually originally part of a totally different optics company. Um, and Carrie Gunn, who is the president of Genolite, was one of the uh, scientific leads at the previous company. Um, and the focus or market of the previous company wasn't quite right. Um, and so the company didn't do well, but the technology technology was sound, right? They were able to fabricate it well. Um, they had all of the production hurdles sorted out. Um, they had like they had a really good system, but their market was just off. And by pivoting, Carrie was able to take everything. And then the company has now been in business for I think 15 years, 
somewhere between 15 to 17 years. Like it, like everything was perfect except the market. Um, and that's, that's like my, my flagship example of how like just by shifting a little bit, we're able to go from like a company that's failing to a company that has fully launched and has multiple products. And he was very fortunate um, that he was able to do that, but not every not every technology is able to do that. Um, it also takes having uh, like a founder uh, who has that sense of like self-realization that they you know, are able to give up on their dream and hand over the technology to somebody else to change markets. Um, because that's that's hard to do because having your own company is a dream. Um, so certainly, uh, I I may have I may have just missed it, but uh, what was the uh, technology specifically? What did it do? Oh, so the so the technology is a micro ring resonator, and so by tracking the exact resonant wavelength or the light that's confined inside the device. Uh, you, you're able to detect if something has stuck onto the device or not. Um, so then the device itself is intrinsically sensitive, uh, but that just means it will go off all the time, right? So having a sensitive device isn't necessarily useful. You want a device to be sensitive and specific. So Carrie uh, also developed surface chemistries. So this gets to your question about, you know, why can't you make something that can detect lots and lots of things? So he developed a series of surface chemistries. So he'll have one sensor that can detect IL-6, one that can detect IL-12, interleukin-6, interleukin-12, which are different markers of different types of cancers and different types of immune responses, immune system responses. So he'll have a, an array and each ring will kind of light up, not actually light up, but generate a signal. Um, depending on the relative concentration of all of these different proteins in the blood. So it was kind of a combination of chemistry, optical engineering, some systems integration, um, not trying to downplay the systems integration part. There was a lot of really clever systems integration that went into this. Uh, but the, the key thing that enabled his pivot between markets was the addition of the surface chemistry. Right. Uh, now, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, optogenetics. Yeah. Uh, you know, optogenetics, uh, it's technology that's seen, you know, a lot of interest in recent years, uh, and it's really easy to understand why. Uh, you know, what sort of opportunities does it present in nanomedicine? Uh, and what do you specifically uh, find exciting about it? Yeah. Um, so to take a step back, uh, optogenetics kind of has two, two key components. Uh, the first is in order for optogenetics to work, you need to genetically engineer the system you're trying to study uh, by adding in a, a modifier to your system that allows you to control the electrical signaling in the cell. Um, so you can either turn it on or turn it off by exposing it to blue light. Uh, so you can't, you can't just do it with a normal human person because our cells are not genetically modified. Um, so that's a really important thing to, I want to establish that so nobody's worried that they're going to be autogenetically stimulated just walking around the street. Um, so an autogenetic modification um, coupled with some sort of stimulator, so it is the stimulator that photonics comes into play, right? How do you get the blue light near the cell? Um, and a lot of, uh, or most of the uh, light delivery systems are based on some sort of blue LED coupled into an optical fiber, coupled into some sort of nano machined probe. Um, and obviously the blue LED, uh, you can then take that and have some sort of like switching system integrated into it, right? Like, can you pulse the LED? Um, change the power on the LED, right? It could be an on-chip system. Uh, then you have your optical fiber. Uh, there's a lot of blue is not a really great wavelength for silica. 
Um, so there's a lot of work going into doing like polymer optical fibers that are have lower loss in the blue range. Um, historically, nobody's really cared about blue. Suddenly, blue is becoming really important. Uh, so you know, like trying to overcome the material loss of blue light getting through optical fiber. So that's you know an an important thing now. Um, can we integrate some sort of you know, nonlinear material that will actually amplify the blue system. Um, maybe we don't actually need to use a blue laser. Maybe we could do like a conversion or something. Uh, you know, all of these are open questions. And then you get into the, the probe part of this, right? You don't just want to have your blue light go into a brain and diffract all over the place. Um, you want to have it very well localized so that you know what cell you're stimulating. Um, otherwise, you might as well just shock the person or shock the mouse, right? Like you, you, you wanna know exactly what you're controlling so then you can look at how that changes behavior, how that changes cell response, so you can actually have a good scientific hypothesis. So different ways people are looking at doing this or creating like aluminum nitride arrays, silicon nitride arrays, even silica arrays, um, lots of different strategies. And again, instead of just having passive arrays, you could think about adding electro-optic modulators on there to like switch different probes on and off. Uh, the original ones, you would just have like a single nanoneedle going in. Um, now they're creating very large arrays, you know, anywhere four up to, I think, the largest one now is like 64 little probes, and you can like controllably switch between them almost like fingers, um, and not just like fingers moving up and down a keyboard, but you know, like little pairs, or you can do all kinds of complex patterns. Um, so all of those different modules, right? The probe part of it, the fiber part of it, and the laser part of it all have like unique special challenges and require unique special skill sets. Uh, but then you also need to put everything together. Um, and that in and of itself is a unique skill set. And you need optical engineers to do that. Um, and the end user are going to be biologists, right? Biologists, animal scientists. Um, and we as optical engineers can't hand them something that is held together by optical glue uh, because they, they need something that they can just like throw around. Um, one of my favorite experiences that really hammered this home, the idea that I need to be able to hand, like hand somebody something that was really robust. Um, I spent a summer in a hospital uh, doing like an internship through all the different divisions of the hospital. And I, spent two weeks in surgery and one of the surgeons did uh, orthoscopic surgery and you usually have like three holes in your stomach and then they inflate it with nitrogen um and one of the holes the light source and the camera go in so they can see what they're doing uh and the surgeon kept complaining that the light source wasn't bright and then i looked down and he was standing on the liquid core optical fiber that was going to the light source and so he, over time, had degraded it because he kept like damaging it and breaking it. And I told him, I was like, yeah, you can't stand on that. And he looked at me and said, but why? Like, it's, there's shielding on it. Like, I stand on the electrical cables all the time. Why does it matter? And it resonated with me. So people that you hand things to, they don't necessarily understand that it's different. If it looks like something else, they're gonna treat it like something else. And you need to assume people are gonna stand on things. Um, so if, if you're making a polymer optical fiber, people may stand on that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the last systems integration part is in, in my lab, nobody would ever stand on a silica optical fiber. Even if it had like a yellow jacket on it, you wouldn't stand on it. But that physician, he stood on it and then complained. Uh, so, yeah, that that was 
That was a lesson, a life lesson. Certainly. Uh, now, I was wondering if you might be able to talk about some of the specific applications uh, that are being worked on with optogenetics uh, and what like the uh, the current capabilities are with that technology. Yeah. Um, so most of the specific applications right now are really in fundamental science or fun fundamental neuroscience. I'm really trying to understand the brain, which is a big picture question, uh, but it's really trying to understand how you know, if you stimulate one part of the brain or maybe turn down the, the activity in one part of the brain, how does that affect the other part of the brain? How does that affect the general activity in one part of the brain? Um, now, let's say that we have a general concept of how one part of the brain, how the activity is working. Let's say we take an engineered mouse and it has Alzheimer's or pre disposition towards Alzheimer's or epilepsy or bipolar disease or some some sort of illness. Now let's do the same experiment all over again, right? Let's stimulate the activity in the brain. Um, let's understand how different types of electrical stimuli change the overall pattern of activation and different stimuli in different regions of the brain affect the overall pattern of activation. Now once we once we understand all of that, which we do not yet, but once we understand all of that, now we can look at how different therapeutics are able to attempt to take the pattern of activation from the animal that has some sort of illness back to that normal brain. So, you know, do you need one therapeutic? Do you need a cocktail of therapeutics? And other researchers are even looking at, do you really need therapeutics at all? You know, if you do like an early prevention or an early treatment of like an oxygen treatment, right? So, for example, a lot of times divers, um, if they get the bends, right, if they come up from deep really, really fast, if they go into an oxygen chamber, uh, they're able to lessen the effects depending on how fast they came up. Um, but the idea of doing oxygen treatments or cold treatments, cold compresses, but exploring non, non classically chemical treatments. Oxygen is technically a chemical, but just not, it's not, a, not what you think of as a chemical. Um, so looking at those, those types of alternative treatments, um, but looking at them in a more quantitative fashion, not just, so how do you feel? Um, but actually, the the activity has in fact been damped, um, or it has been activated, uh, and seeing if there are alternative ways that we can try to reduce the amount of chemicals we take. Because uh, if you take fewer therapeutics, or you take more effective therapeutics, your liver will be happier, your kidneys will be happier. Right? Personally, I like it if my kidneys and liver are happy. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, now, what would you say we're sort of aiming towards uh, with optogenetics? You know, what uh, I guess what's the holy grail application uh, for optogenetics? So this is a great question, and it's one you will get a lot of different answers to. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, the holy grail application would be to use it in drug discovery um, to to be able to use it to like correctly identify um, early on in a drug trial if a therapeutic was actually going to be effective or not um, the role of a therapeutic in in its mechanism uh, there are a lot of other researchers that are looking to make optogenetics an actual treatment alternative uh, in other words, you could have an implantable laser-based device that you could use to control your brain. Uh, so that, in their mind, that's the uh, holy grail for optogenetics. Um, you know, instead of having metal electrodes, you could have optogenetic systems or the optical analog of, of an electrode array. Because uh, right now there are, uh, for uh, some epilepsy patients, 
uh, having implantable devices is proving to be uh, a useful therapy. Um, so it, it depends who you ask, where they think it's where they think the field is going. Uh, right now, I view it more as a therapeutic development tool than an implantation tool. Right. Uh, now, I guess from uh, kind of a big picture question, uh, from like a societal perspective, uh, what sort of impact uh, with these technologies and uh, not just optogenetics, but, you know, lab mm -hmm. on a chip as well. Uh, what sort of impact would these technologies have uh, upon, you know, say like the developing world? Mm -hmm. So whenever I think of technologies impacting the developing world, I always think about it both from uh, the clinician perspective, right? So if I give a clinician like a genetic sequencer and they're able to tell that somebody has an illness, just having that information is kind of useful, but if they can have the information and it tells them a specific course of action they can take and action that they can actually take, then that is invaluable. Um, and right now, a lot of the tools at uh, the hands of the physicians aren't necessarily useful because the courses of action that physicians have are, are very limited. Uh, so a lot of the new optical technologies being developed that are being disseminated are both lower cost and they also don't involve as many peripherals. So there, there are pictures from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where centrifuges, which is a way of purifying a sample, they're used as doorstops because they break and then there's no one to fix them. So the idea of creating a lab on a chip device where it doesn't matter if it breaks because it's inexpensive and it doesn't need to be fixed. So I think that's where it's a, it's a huge advance because now you're giving physicians a tool that they can actually use. It doesn't matter if it breaks because they can just get another one. And this thing isn't gonna become a doorstop in their clinic. Uh, and then they can use it to actually get information and actually make a decision. Uh, so that <clears throat> now as far as what, what impact it will have immediately, um, you know, hopefully they're gonna be able to prescribe treatments um, or in the case of, you know, some illnesses, you know, put patients into quarantine, which a lot of times is the best possible treatment, um, especially some diseases don't even actually have uh, symptoms. And so you really wanna isolate asymptomatic patients uh, just to prevent spread until the asymptomatic patient gets better. So again, the lower cost of a therapy or the lower cost a diagnostic test has, then the higher probability you can start thinking about doing screening uh, as a preventative. I think about my the building I work in, they do a lot of screening. Excellent. Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, thank you for having me. It was uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, looking forward to uh, uh, to releasing it. Um, I must admit, this is my first uh, this is my first interview, so you know, not exactly uh, sure how to close it. Uh, but again, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Yeah, um, and I wish you the best of luck with all of your future interviews. Uh, they, they tend to get easier as you go. So Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, have a good day. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, too. It's been a pleasure. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthings at photonics.com. 
All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com.